And this week is a interesting week in my life, personally, because I am under self-isolation. I have not been around virtually a soul in the past week. This is day seven of isolation for me, so in case I'm looking a little scraggly at the sides, that might be why, if the video is actually working. I have no idea if this is broadcasting live or not. And unfortunately, although I did have a guest that did say they were going to join today, it looks like they are not going to be joining, so that's going to be making things a little difficult on my end for the day. But carrying along, I'm going to start the show with actually a Sean Kennedy rant. I've been kind of wanting to play this one for a while. This one does have a video to go with it, but I think it's going, it's just a rant. Sean Kennedy is good for rants, and this is a rant, one of his many rants, the From the Mind. And we'll kick off with that, and then we'll go from there. <sighs> You know what's really weird? You get a lot of people and they look around in the world today, you see everything happening in society, you see everything on the internet, you see everything in advertising, all that kind of jazz. You know what it winds up being? It winds up being confusion. Confusion and distraction. Distraction and confusion. Confusion is the tool to stop your brain, your mind, from focusing on the things that are important to you. That's the problem. That's what you need to wonder about. You gotta get yourself focused. If you don't have focus, you're a bitch. Without focus of the mind, you got nothing. Without focus of the mind, you can't focus on the things that are important to you. Why are commercials designed the way they are? It's all shock cut, shock cut, shock cut. Cut. Everything's in on you, right in your face. You can never determine what's important to you. You can never see what's important to you. You can only see what they want you to see. And then, after you've been deeply programmed, after you've been cramming your little self for a while, you're bitched. You're bitched. You got nothing you can go with. And then what? Then what do you have, huh? Then you're just lost. You're wandering around. No idea who the hell you are. You got no focus. You got nothing going on in the mind. The mind is important. Your own mind is important. That's what you need to remember. Okay, so how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you purify your mind? How do you keep yourself so your head's clean and clear and you can think? First thing you gotta do is shut everything else off. You gotta close down all the other things that are really important and don't really matter. You sit there and you got all this television and wanting and needing and wants and needs your needs and wants and everything gets all fucked up and you have no idea which is important, which is not important. Stand back, unplug, turn everything off, sit in the dark for a while. Gotta reboot the head, man. You gotta reboot the head, man. Because if you don't reboot the head, you're fucked. You're fucked. And then what? Then what? Then what do you do? You're sitting there, you have no idea what you want. So you have to unfocus. You have to sit there, turn everything off, and then turn it back on and think about who you are. What is it that you want? What do you want out of life? What would other people see if they sat back and watched you for a long period of time? What would be the thing that they witness out of your life? No one thing you gotta remember is how important you are. You gotta remember how important your own thoughts are, your own beliefs, your own ideals. Because you know what? At the end of the day, nothing that anybody, anyone else says matters. People come at me all the time saying, hey, Sean, hey, Sean, you should do this. Hey, Sean, you should do that. Why do you run cult this way? Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to go to MTV? Why do you want to talk to people in modern media? Hey, you don't like it? Fuck you, okay? I've got no time for that, all right? I'm just trying to live my life and do what I want with my thing. You want to do something? You do something your own way. Do it your own way. You don't need me. You don't need television. You don't need Gandhi, Buddha, God, nothing, man. You don't need none of that. You gotta unplug the mind and focus in on yourself because you are your own person. That's what's important. 
So what are you supposed to take out of this? What's the idea you're supposed to have inside your own head? The number one idea that you got to have inside your own head is that you don't need anybody. You don't need anyone. You always got to remember what's important and what's important for you. Don't start buying shit just because you see some images on the screen on the TV. Don't listen to Sean K because Sean K tells you stuff. Don't listen to the media because the media tells you stuff. Don't listen to Henry Rollins or Jello Biafra or Noam Chomsky or any of those guys just because they tell you stuff. Go make up your own mind. Get all your data. Make your own decision. And always remember, hey, I could be wrong. My name is Sean Kennedy and I am the fucking man. So that was, again, the from the mind rant. And I wanted to bring it up because, well, first of all, this week for me personally has been a week of unplugging and a week of turning a lot of things, not everything off, but a lot of things off and not having access to a good part of the world. Although I do still have the internet, I do still have books and some people online to chat with to keep company, but it is worth it sometimes. And I've done some meditations on this show. So it is worth considering though, that it's possible to be overstimulated with the media in our lives. And it's possible to have too much going on in our world and that we can get to the point where we are overburdened and where we are beyond our limits. And the feeling of being beyond your limit in this sense is stress. It's depression and worry and panic and anxiety and all these these negative emotions, especially in regards to ourselves, can come from this situation of just having too much going on and not having any control over the important things in your life. And that little bit of advice that just disconnect, reset, turn everything off, ground yourself, find everything that's going on and just try to get a little bit of distance from what's going on and then slowly but surely from that point of just being with yourself bringing yourself back and then finding the important things in your life and focusing on them i've been listening to a lot of derek sivers over the past couple of weeks before this self-isolation period started and some of his advice goes along similar lines in terms of find what's important and focus on that because the other things in your life are going to demand your attention they're going to demand your focus and they're going to demand the little bit of focus that you do have in your life be broken up into a billion different chunks and split amongst them and it's very very easy to get distracted and to do things that while are important and while are valuable in and of themselves might not be the one thing that is important or most important to you personally. And whoever you are who are listening to this, that could be a lot of different things. Maybe the important thing in your life is your family. Maybe the important thing in your life is changing something about the world. Whatever it is, it's worth asking at some points whether or not you're focusing on the right things. And disconnecting can help you choose where to direct your attention. But that's not the only thing going on. I mean, it's kind of the only thing going on in my life right now. But I did want to talk about a couple of different things. And the first I wanted to talk about is to tell a little bit of a story about when I was in high school many, many years ago. And when I was still floundering around, discovering what was important in my life, I fell in with a group of girls. And I, at the time, was in grade nine. So I was like, I had just started high school, hadn't really uh, found that much connection with other people yet. But I had found this group of girls and I just, for whatever reason, managed to sit down with them during lunch hours and chat. And there was, they mostly talked amongst themselves and I mostly just listened because they were older and I was more interested in kind of learning from them rather than being a participant in the drama of their lives. And they were happy with that. I was happy with that. Everything worked well. And one day, while I was sitting and listening, and they were talking about the various things that were going on in their world, there was a group of guys who came and walked through the hallway that we were sitting in and stopped. And I could tell right away, just by body language, that something wasn't right. And they had this aura of aggressiveness around them. And although I don't remember exactly how the conversation went, word for word what happened was the lead guy alpha male demanded that i give him money that whatever lunch money i had or whatever money i had on me either i could give him that or they would rough me up and beat me up and they were bigger than me certainly the lead guy was and i didn't want 
to cause any conflict. And I didn't want, even though I, I, the threat of violence itself, it was scary. And it was, it was belittling to be the guy who was being told to fork over money and to basically do what you were told by the bully. That part, it seemed like that wasn't the, the main issue for me. The main issue for me was looking bad in front of my friends, these older girls, and looking, basically causing a fuss. And I didn't want the situation to become more than it was. And I figured that, oh, maybe if I just like give him a little bit of money, he'll go away. And I had some money for lunch. I had some money on me. It wasn't much, maybe five bucks or two bucks or whatever it was. And I started get, pulling out my wallet and got ready to give it to them. Now, the girls, being older, knew what the right thing to do was. And they knew to tell me, no, put that wallet away. Don't give them a dime. And they wound up in, trying to intervene and trying to, to convince them to go away. And luckily, something happened. It didn't get to the point where there was any kind of physical struggle beyond just these very intimidating group, this very intimidating group of young boys threatening me. Like they may have pushed me up against a wall or something like that to be credible, but it really didn't come to any kind of blow. Maybe the lunch hour ended before that could happen. But just that feeling that I was not the one in control in that situation. I distinctly remember that. And I distinctly remember the after effect of that, where I was realizing, as we were talking about it after the fact, and after the situation was successfully diffused, that in my mind, I would give them the money, and then they would go away, and everything would be better. And the older girls knew, and I became very quickly convinced that that would not happen. That was not how that was going to play out. And how that would actually play out would be the next day they would do the same thing. The next day they would do the same thing. And if they knew that they could get money out of me, they would always come back. And even if I somehow successfully avoided the violence part of it, and if I avoided the confrontation and the embarrassment of confrontation in front of my peers or friends or people I respected, it wouldn't matter. The conflict would come and that was not something I could avoid. And we can talk perhaps at a later story about how to deal with the conflict side of that. But that particular situation, that group of people coming up and demanding, you have to give us money. You have to give us something that is yours or else. That was definitely not the last time that that happened to me. And that that has happened to groups that I've been part of after that. After seeing and thinking through the three of possible outcomes, you only have to go through it once to realize you can't capitulate, you can't give in, you can't just fork over the money because they'll just keep coming back. So, in an unrelated story, there is one story that came up this week. So, here's a story from, oh, it doesn't include the link. Let's see if I can quickly find it here. Looks like it's from The Guardian or something. And this one's from the Daily Mail, so it's the Daily Mail, you never know. Sometimes they're not the most accurate news source in the world, but, quote, police will end, quote, digital strip search, unquote, tactic de of demanding mobile phones from rape victims after some were told prosecutions would be stopped if they did not comply. This is in the UK, of course, but, quote, the practice was rolled out by the National Police Chiefs Council, the NPCC, last year in response to the disclosure scandal. However, a string of defendants had charges against them dropped when critical material emerged as they went on trial. Campaigners dubbed their introduction a, quote, digital strip search and raised fears that it would deter people from coming forward with complaints. So I, I'm just going to pause here. A strip search is a very invasive and very personal and invading of personal space thing. I have never been strip searched personally so maybe I'm, I'm just imagining things in a certain way but in my mind at least a search of your phone can be a more personally invasive thing we store our entire social lives on these computing devices people keep all kinds of details about themselves on the phone that a mere strip search would not reveal obviously being naked in front of someone and being forcibly stripped that is going to be a traumatic thing no matter what but it's worth underlining that it may be more traumatic to have every personal detail of your life revealed or by force. 
Anyway, continuing along the story, quote, police forces in England and Wales are to withdraw the controversial, quote, digital strip search forms that allowed officers to examine the mobile phones of rape victims. The practice, which gave officers access to messages, photographs, emails, and social media, and social media accounts, holy, was rolled out by the NPCC last year in a bid to standardize procedures across all forces as part of a response to the disclosure scandal. A string of defendants, including student Liam Allen, then 22, had charges of rape and serious sexual assault against them dropped when critical material emerged as they went on trial. But the digital consent forms were heavily criticized when it emerged that victims of crime, including rape, were told that refusing to allow investigators access to their data could mean prosecutions were halted. So I guess that's the 18-month investigation by the uh, Information Commissioner's Office found excessive amounts of personal data were often being extracted and that the NPCC forms did not make clear the lawful basis of f- or for the request. I.e., this isn't just a warrant for the, something specific on the phone and then the detail on that phone is sought after for that very specific detail. No, no, this is like a dragnet of someone's personal life and the details of the personal life being sucked up by the police and then used as basically blackmail or at least the blackmail being that either you give us all this data and allow us the ability to blackmail you on other things or this very deeply personal and grievous harm that has been visited on your life will mean nothing to us and then we will just let it happen and that the society you live in will be allow this rapist this person who who traumatized you to do the same thing to someone else. That's basically what's going on here. Quote, Assistant Chief Constable Tim Meyer, NPCC Lead for Disclosure, has written to all forces in England and Wales to inform them of the change. So things are getting better in that this isn't happening anymore, but it's still pretty telling uh, the level of respect for women in the police force in the UK that this is happening. Quote, he said, quote, police and prosecutors have the duty to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry in every investigation and to disclose any material that undermines the case for the prosecution or assists the case for the accused. So no victim should feel discouraged from reporting a crime to the police. And then it continues a little bit of legalese from there. Their effect has been to delay rape cases and deter many victims from coming forward. I, so that's not just the effect of the particular cases involved here that we're talking about. It's not just the impact of blackmailing a woman so that their rapist can get off and then rape someone else. It's that then in the future, other women won't come forward or haven't been coming forward. And then other rapists are allowed to get away with it and victimize more women and maybe men. And quote, this is the, again, actually that's probably it for this story. But the point is that this has been happening in the UK. now. The next question from there is, are they doing the same here? If our police is looking to what other police systems in around the world are doing, is this one of the things that they're going to try? I haven't heard it yet, uh, but is that because nobody's looking and nobody's listening to these rape victims, or is it because it's not actually happening here? That's kind of the big question. Still pretty low that they had ever tried to do this in the first place. So what else is going on? The uh, one thing that's been happening over the past couple of weeks, which you will not hear about on Facebook, you will probably not hear about it. Oh, it looks like you'll hear a little bit about it on Twitter, but not as much perhaps. But on things like Facebook, you won't, is the DDoS secrets. This is a database that was released. Uh, Let's actually go to it right now. The Distributed Denial of Secrets is a, quote, transparency collective aimed at enabling the free transmission of data in the public interest. We aim to avoid any political, corporate, or personal leanings, and to act as a simple beacon of available information. As a collective, we do not support any cause, idea, or message beyond ensuring that information is available to those who need it most, the people. While we are happy to serve as an index to data of all varieties, all must meet the following two criteria. Is the data of public interest? Can a prima facie case be made for the veracity of the contents? Unless already public or is authorized by our source, we do not disclose the providing party of any information and we are fully committed to ensuring their anonymity from all threats. We can never advise on the perfect procedure for transferring data to us or anyone else, but we can act as a shield for that process and share advice 
from our experience. Often our role is to not just make data available, but to act as an anonymity guard to pass data to journalists or other figures best positioned to interrogate it. So what are some of the data points in this database or collection of databases? What do we have here? So we have in Africa, we have the Chamber of Mines of South Africa, and then they have a link to the magnet link. So you need BitTorrent to grab this stuff. For China, they have from the Chinese Ministry of Commerce, quote, documents released through paranoia alleging they're allegedly containing deals about deals with Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. The documents are partly in English, Russian, and Chinese. One document obtained from the Chinese Foreign Office in Minsk indicates relations between the notorious Russian mob boss Merit Balugula and high-ranking Ukrainian politicians. So that's kind of interesting sounding. We have a bunch of other stuff on Russia. But the reason that I was going to bring this up, though, is actually the American side of it. Let's see here. From the United States of America, we've got 50 Days of Lulls. From LulzSec, we have Blue Leaks. There we go. 24 years of data from over 200 police departments, fusion centers, and training slash support resources hacked by Anonymous. Which is, of course, the big issue this past couple of weeks, other than COVID, of course is the Black Lives Matter protests and the abuses and overreaches and violence coming from the police in the United States. And especially over the past 20 years or so, the police have built these quote-unquote fusion centers, both in the United States and here in Canada, that allow for different levels of law enforcement and military to work together to track and manage the never mind public protesters, but the citizens of the, the countries that they live in. And while I don't know the full details of all of the scope of what these fusion centers are monitoring and capable of, it is telling that they use things like Stratfor, that they use so much of our personal information is kind of soaked up into them through surveillance companies that Barrett Brown has talked a lot about. And Barrett Brown specifically has gone into a lot of detail of what's going on in these fusion centers how coordinated a lot of the activity is in the United States and here in Canada in terms of that. But one of the good things about having all the data in kind of one place, one instant or a set of institutions, is that something like this could exist, that there are records that the way that the U.S. government and the Canadian government, in terms of the police actual implementation of oppression, of the stifling of dissent, of the abuse of the public that they serve, is documented. And this is the documentation. Now, this is a big collection of data, 260 gigabytes of data. Like, I have enough space to store it, but it's, it's still huge. Like, this is going to take you quite a while to download unless your internet connection is quite large. But at the same time, as long as somebody has it, it's likely that it'll be available for people like journalists to go through it. So if you live in a country where it is safe to do so, you can download a BitTorrent client and grab this magnet, which I'm going to post wherever this video is posted, and uh, you can go through it. Now, the reason why I bring this up and kind of point this out is because it is banned to link to this particular data source on Facebook. It's, quote, against the community standards to link to the actual raw data that allows for public interest groups to verify, oh, is this police officer that's out in the public right now beating up protesters, do they have a history of beating up people, a history of violence against the public? These are the kinds of questions that we can start getting answers for, for everyone involved, at least on the police side, of this most recent period of unrest in the United States. And in, here in Canada. And I've seen videos of people pulling data from this database and reading it in public as the police are surrounding them and basically looking and going, oh, this cop right here, who are they? This is their badge number, so we know who they are. This is their name, and this is the abuses that they have done. Now, again, I'm not going to link to that video specifically, but it's just the kind of thing that you can do with this data. And so if you have access to someone who is interested in how the police actually work, perhaps a journalist in your life or a, a journalist or a researcher of some kind, this is the data set you want to make sure that they have. So you can grab it and then give it to them. And, but this is not the only thing, of course, on this DDoS secrets. 
they have the WikiLeaks cable gate data. They have, let's see, CIA code from Schultz, Schultz's uh, GitHub, some hacked materials from CIA director John Brennan's personal email account at AOL, because of course the <laughs> this guy, Hyatt, who is this John Brennan guy? I thought he was like the head of the CIA or something. CIA director? What is a director? Is at the top? Uh, let's see here. Head of the CIA. Yeah, okay. So that's pretty hilarious that the head of the CIA uses AOL, or at least did at one point. And so this is just like a small sampling of the data that they have and that you can get it. It's available from BitTorrent by just grabbing it from DDoS Secrets. Now, if you live in a country where it's unsafe to have this kind of data, then maybe it's a good idea to, to not grab it, or at least if you are going to grab it, use Tor uh, or something like Tor, like Tribbler. But here in Canada, at least, it's uh, it's questionable, but it's still uh, within... I haven't heard of anyone getting snatched up because of this. But of course, in the States, it's questionable to do anything. I've heard a good couple of accounts now of people who are involved in the protests being snatched up after the fact, so not at the protest. It's not like you're at a protest and the protest gets a little bit too rowdy and the police come in and arrest everyone, or maybe they skip the rowdy part and they just come in and arrest everyone. But after the fact, people who were peacefully protesting, the police through these fusion centers track them, and then after the fact, come in and arrest them, take them away and disappear them. This used to be the sort of thing that you hear about more in banana republics and fascist dictatorships in Central America. Nowadays, you hear it in the United States. And that's just the way things are down there now. Certainly a lot of people protesting, trying to change that. But so far, without too much success. And uh, so that's one of the things that's been going on this week. But it's also worth telling them that with the police coming in, snatching everyone up, and with the military, whether National Guard or uh, otherwise, being brought in and facing off against peaceful protesters, in addition to rioters, like there's definitely rioting going on in the States as well, but they're being used on both. While this is all going on, what is the debate? What is the, the opposition in the United States doing? What is the most organized group of opponents to the Trump regime doing about the situation. Let's see if we can bring up the tweet here. This is from, from one David Sirota, a little while ago now. So what is the response to this? What is the thing they're trying to do to stop all of this is, quote, Nancy Pelosi is trying to give Donald Trump more police power. She's pushing to reauthorize the Patriot Act, that lovely bill, to give him more police and surveillance power so to empower these fusion center surveillance centers. Quote, right now, this is completely unacceptable. And then he provides a link. And this is to uh, too much information, a sub stack. Quote, 10 things Dems could do right now if they actually wanted to stop Trump's power grab. Uh, and obviously one of the things that they, uh, number one, for the love of God, stop trying to give Trump more police power. So this is kind of the, the rub here. This is kind of the problem because there's this false dichotomy presented in things like the U.S. presidential election and the uh, the elections of Congress and the Senate leading up to this, that it's presented to the, the U.S. public and to the world as this big battle between good and evil, and then you have Trump on the one hand, you have Biden on the other, you have all of this choice between police going crazy and arresting everyone and black bagging people and taking them away without telling their family where they're going, without giving them access to a lawyer, in some cases even just outright killing them. And you have the other side, which is, I guess, trying to make things worse. Where's the choice here? Where is the option for a more democratic United States of America? Where is the option to de-escalate the police? It's not here. It's not on the Democrat side, that's for sure. So where is it? That's kind of a question I'll leave to you as the listener. That's one of the things going on. And uh, the United States. Certainly the rest of the world is, is doing better, right? Shotgun to Europe. This is the quote, imagine doing this and thinking you're the good guys. Are we gonna talk about the fact that official reports from the European Parliament are openly and approvingly talking about implementing their own version of the Great Firewall of China? It links to the action plan, the European clouds slash European internet. Quote, a European firewall slash cloud slash internet would foster a digital ecosystem. Oh, they're painting in something nice and green and sustainable quote in europe based on data and innovation it would drive competition and set standards similar to what has happened in china in the past 20 years the foundations of such a european cloud are democratic values transparency competition and data protection 
Like the Chinese firewall, this European internet would block off services that condone or support unlawful conduct from third-party countries. Officially launching the European internet, similar to the Chinese firewall. And then it talks about doing this as part of 6G, which is presumably their next generation cell phone network after 5G. And so that's where the European Union is going, which again is what are they using the Chinese firewall for? To silence people, to prevent people from organizing, to prevent people from thinking certain thoughts or having access to certain information about what happened in history, to prevent people from being able to do something about abuse both of human rights and larger scale abuses, to prevent people from organizing and forming unofficial unions, all kinds of things like that. And the technology is the same, so the, the outcome is going to be the same. It's going to be used to stifle human rights in the EU. It's going to be used to keep people from being able to have access to certain information. The outcome is the same on both of these sides. They're using the same tools and they can say that it's for human rights. They can say that it's uh, only against unlawful behavior, but the laws in question are going to be things against, for example, using certain words, against associating with people who use certain words against people who link to things like DDoS secrets. That in the EU is probably going to be illegal if it isn't already. And that's the sort of thing that you can on a technical level actually prevent when the whole internet is controlled under one institution, whoever controls this quote, European cloud. So we have both all of these things going on, all of this restrictions coming, this architecture of oppression being designed around us. And yes, we have access to things like DDoS secrets right now. And yes, we have little bits of hope coming from the change of police practice in the UK. But it's important to go back to the start. What is important in your life? What is the thing worth fighting for? What is worth for you to be focusing on? Are all these things distractions from it? Is there someone you can work with to help? And how can we approach these problems? Is it all overwhelming? Anyway, I think that's enough for this week. This was a little scatterbrained because I did hope to have a guest this week. And there will hopefully be more of an organized show next week, which you can help the organization of this show by going to subscribestar.com slash Jeff dash Cliff. And with that, I will fade out with the goodbye song. And hopefully you out there had a good week. Hopefully you're able to keep focusing, and I will see you all next week. We'll see you tomorrow, but in the meanwhile, always remember to be good and so...